This lecture is on the chi-square goodness of fit test. This test can be used with a single categorical variable and can be used as an alternative but equivalent test to the single proportions test in certain, si certain situations, which we'll investigate in this lecture. Let's look at a motivating example. A survey by the Pew Research Center collected demographic information on 1,000 Facebook users. One piece of information they collected was the age of the user. The frequency of the user's age by age group are shown in the frequency table below. We can see that there are more 18 to 29 year olds and 30 to 49 year olds than there are 65 year olds in our sample. One question we might be interested in is whether the age groups are equally likely to use Facebook in the population. Clearly, this isn't the case in our specific sample. But what about in the population? Now, if the four age groups were equally likely to use Facebook, what proportion of all Facebook users would we expect to fall into each of the four age groups? We have four age groups and the total proportion is one. So I guess it would make sense for it to be one over four because one over four would make all the proportions equal. And that's what our null hypothesis is. Our null hypothesis in this situation is that the four proportions are equal to one another. And because they're equal to one another, they're all equal to 0.25 or one over four. The alternative hypothesis is that at least one of the proportions is not equal to 0.25. Now, one thing we might be wondering about is if we surveyed 1000 Facebook users and our null hypothesis were true, what number would we expect for each age group? Well, if we look at our null hypothesis, we can see that the proportion is 0 0.25. 0 0.25 times 1,000, well, that's 250. So that would be the value that we would expect for each of those age groups if the null hypothesis was true. And this is what's known as the expected count. We can see that it's formally written um, uh, using this equation below, and that it's the sample size times the proportion for each age class when the null hypothesis is true. In this situation, the proportion for each group is 0.25, which again, the proportions don't always have to be equal to another. They are just in this situation. So it's gonna be 0.25 times the sample size, which is 1000, and that's gonna be 250. So it's gonna be 250 for each of those four different age groups. Now, one thing that we often will do is when we're, when we're trying to build up this motivation to use this, this test um, to answer this research question, um, or mo uh, when we're building up to, to use our test, excuse me, um, is that what we'll do is we'll take our expected count and we'll, we'll add an additional column to our table. So our table um, before, it wasn't labeled observed, it was just labeled frequency. But what we have are observed frequencies and our expected frequencies. So the observed frequencies are that middle column and the expected frequencies are the column on the right. And we can see when the null hypothesis is true, the column on the right is what we would expect and the column in the middle is what we observed. So ultimately, we kind of want to understand this. Are the observed counts of Facebook users per age group further from the expected counts of Facebook users per age group than we would expect by chance alone, given that the four age groups are equally likely to use Facebook, or given that the null hypothesis is true. So to answer that question and to understand how likely or unlikely our results are, how likely or unlikely our observed counts, um, given that the null hypothesis is true, we're going to calculate something called the chi-square statistic. And that's what that, that fancy looking X is. It's pronounced chi. And it's going to be chi is equal to, chi squared is equal to the sum of the observed count for each one of those cells minus its expected count squared divided by the expected count. Let's see how this works. And because there's, oh, sorry. And because there's that sum size side, you're gonna add that up for all of the cells together. Let's see how this works. 
So for the age class of 18 to 29, we had that the observed count was 290, and that we had that the expected count was 250. We're going to square that, and we're going to divide by the expected count. For the second age class, which was age class 30 to 49, we had the observed count as 290. We're going to subtract from that the expected count, which is 250. We're going to square that divided by 250. And we're going to do that for the other two remaining age groups. Once you've done out your math, you're going to see you get, you get 6.4 plus 6.4 plus 0 plus 25.6, which is going to equal 38.4. And that's going to be our chi-square. So we're going to have a chi-square statistic of 38.4. Now, is that a big number? Is that a small number? We're not quite sure yet. We want to know how unlikely or unusual it is that we would observe this if the four age groups were equally likely to use Facebook. Now, one option we could do is we could do a randomization test. And we've talked about randomization tests a lot this semester. But one, one thing we could do is we could have a bag containing four pieces of paper labeled 18 to 29, 30 to 49, 50 to 64, and 65 plus. So we're going to have four pieces of paper in there. So our chances of drawing each of those age groups by themselves is 1 over 4. So what we could do is we could take a random sample from that bag with replacement of size equals 1,000. So essentially we would, we would have our four numbers in there, our four pieces of paper in there, we would draw one piece of paper, see which age group it is, put it back in there, and do this again and again uh, for 999 more times, each time recording which age group came up. Because we know that in that situation, the null hypothesis is true. And that is that the proportions are equal to one another. Because the proportions are in our bag. Each one is 0.25. We have four pieces of paper, one with each of these age groups. So we would calculate our chi-square statistic. We would repeat um, and um, for each of those samples, and then we would do this say ten thousand times. You know, when we like we usually do when we create a randomization test. And then what we're going to do is we're going to locate our chi-square test statistic in uh, that randomization distribution, and we're going to identify the number of uh, chi-square statistics that are as extreme or more extreme than thirty-eight point four. So this is what a randomization distribution looks like. And I want to remind you that our, our chi-square um, uh, chi statistic was 38.4. So it's not even over on this at all. It's probably over here. But something to note about the randomization distribution is that it's skewed, right? So it goes up. It's got this strong right skew. And that is going to be the case with the chi-square statistic. It's going to look like this. It's going to have this hump just to the left of um, zero, typically, and then it's going to have this tail that goes off to the left. And this is what it looks like here. This is our actual distribution, and it's um, or our distribution that we, um, given that our null hypothesis is true, <clears throat> that we would expect our chi-squared test statistic to follow. And it's going to be a chi-squared distribution with three degrees of freedom. We'll talk about how you calculate that momentarily. But you can see it has the same shape as our randomization distribution. And again, if we wanted to find 38.4, it's like way over here. So as you can probably imagine, the values that are as extreme or more than that are going to be very small. So our p-value will be very small, essentially less than 0. I mean less than 0 0.001. OK, so let's formalize this. So this is known as the chi-square goodness of fit test. Next lecture, we're going to learn about another chi-squared test, but the goodness of fit test is the first one we're going to learn about. And how does it work? So we have a hypothesis about the proportions of a categorical variable, a single categorical variable, based on a table of observed counts in our k cells. So each of those little um, numbers in our frequency table are referred to as cells. So what we want to do is we want to specify a proportion, p sub i, for each cell. In this case, we said that we'd expect each of those cells to come up one out of four times in our age group. But again, that doesn't need to be the case. It can be predetermined based on the uh, context of the problem. 
and our alternative is always going to be at least one piece of i is not as specified. What we're going to do is we're going to compute the expected count for each cell using this n times p sub i, where n is the sample size, then p sub i is the value given in the null. We're going to compute the value of our chi-squared test statistic um, using that formula I just showed you, which is the sum of all of those cells where you're doing observed minus expected squared divided by expected. And then we're going to find the p-value for our chi-square using the upper tail, and it's always the upper tail of a chi-square distribution with k minus 1 degrees of freedom. And k is going to be our number of cells, right? So it's our number of cells. So we had four cells, right? We had four different age groups, 4 minus 1, that's 3, okay? So it's k cells, k minus 1 degrees of freedom. So the chi-square distribution is going to work if our sample size is large enough that each of the expected counts is at least uh, 5. So we can formalize that as saying n sub p sub i oops, has to be larger or equal to 5. Now in our case, our, n, our expected counts were 250, so we clearly met that assumption. Right, so our test statistics, 38.4, we had four cells, degrees of freedom is four minus one, so our degrees of freedom is three. Now we can use our stat key to go through and to actually calculate our p-value. So we would open up stat key, we would click chi-square, we're going to enter three in our degrees of freedom, and then we're going to hit enter, and then our, our chi-square distribution is going to look like this. We're going to click right tail, and you're always going to click right tail with a chi-square. And then we're going to punch in down here this value of 38.4. And then we're going to have our p-value here. And our p-value is going to be less than 0 0.001, just as expected, right? We based, on that, based that on those two graphs I showed earlier. So we can see um, by looking at... Um, uh, you might well. One thing you might be wondering is, okay, so our alternative was that one of the proportions is not equal to the pre-specified null hypothesis value. Well, how can I tell which category it is that's really the one that is not equaling the expected value? Well, one thing you can do is you can look at its chi-square contribution, which is the amount of uh, which is the amount of the chi-square test statistic that corresponds to a particular cell. And so remember when we were doing that chi-square uh, slide, we saw that for the first two it was 6.4, um, was this observed minus expected squared divided by expected. And then for the last one it was 25.6. So this value is really large. So it's really that the number of people that are using Facebook um, that are 65 plus are way less than we would expect. Right? We observe them to have 170, we expect them to have 250, they're having way less. And we can also see that there's slightly more 18 to 29 year olds and 30 to 49 year olds that are using Facebook than we would expect given that the null hypothesis is true or given that these proportions are all equal to one another. Now let's look at another example. Now this example is going to be um, interesting because in this one we're not going to set the proportions equal to one another. Okay, so our question says, how do you position yourself when you're going to sleep? A website states that 41% of us start in the fetal position, 28% start on our side with legs straight, 13% start on the back, and 7% on their stomach. The remaining 11% have no standard starting sleep position. If a random sample of 1,000 people produces the frequencies given below, would you doubt the proportions given in the article on the website? Perform a statistical test to answer this question. So we're given a frequency table. If you're given a frequency table and you're asked about proportions, not a single proportion, then you know, hey, I should do a chi-square test. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out our null hypothesis. Well, our null hypothesis is going to be that the proportion that start out in the fetal position is 0.41 of that number and the proportion that start in with their on their sides with their legs out straight is going to be 28 percent or 
it's going to be 13% or 0.3 on their back, 0 0.07 on their stomach or 7%, and the remaining, remaining 11% have no standard starting seat position. And remember, our alternative is going to be always for the chi-square, at least one piece of I is not as specified. Great. So hopefully those proportions make sense to you. Now, if we were going, if our null hypothesis wasn't, or if our, our research question wasn't, should you doubt the proportions given in the article, but instead, like, are people equally likely to lay on, um, to start in any of these sleep positions, then while we have five sleep positions, well, technically we have four, but we have one that's no preference. So it would be one over five, which would be the null hypothesis in that case, but that's not the case. We want to test specifically the proportions given in on this website. So we observed 391, 257, 156, 89, 107. Our expected count is going to be 410, and that's going to be 1,000 times 0.41. And this is 1,000 times 0.28. And this is 1,000 times 0.13. And this is 1,000 times 0.07. And this is 1,000 times 11. I mean, 0.11, right? So this is the N, and these are their piece of I's, right? Next thing to do is we calculate our chi-square test statistic. So it's our observed minus our expected for the um, for fetal. So this is fetal, and this is legs out straight. I think side with legs straight. I think I did SLS, yeah, I did. And then this is back, and then this is uh, <clears throat> stomach, and this is no preference. And this is their observed minus their expected squared. So 391 minus 410 squared divided by 410. And then we got 257 minus 280 squared divided by 280 and so on for the other positions. If you do that math out, you should get 0.880 plus 1.889 plus 5.20 plus 5.16 plus 0.082. We're gonna add all those together and our chi-square test statistic is 13.21. So what would we do? Well, we're gonna fire up our stat key. We're gonna go into the chi-square test statistic part. We need our number of, we need to figure out our degrees of freedom which is the number of cells minus one. And you can also think of the number of cells if that's confusing you is think of the number of pre-specified proportions. Well, we have one, two, three, four, five. So it's five minus one equals four. Our degrees of freedom equals four, which is what's specified here. We're gonna come down here, type in 13.21 after we've clicked right tail and our p-value is equal to 0 0.010. In other words, it seems as though the proportions that have been specified in this journal are not being supported by our sample, right? <clears throat> um, because if the proportions were supported by our sample, we would not reject the null hypothesis. But in the situation, if we were gonna uh, compare this to alpha equals 0 0.05, we would reject and even if we didn't reject, we know we have strong evidence in favor of the alternative, weak evidence in favor of the null, and we can state that actually um, we should doubt those proportions given in the article. Let's look at one more example. And in this example, we're going to understand the or be able to see the equivalence of the two approaches of using a single proportions test and using a chi-square test of uh, a chi-square goodness of fit test. So this example now is a little old, um, but a CBS news survey of 3,380 adults found that 1,791 of the adults that were surveyed, or 52.988%, approved of the Trump impeachment inquiry. inquiry. Does this provide evidence that the percent of adults that support the impeachment inquiry is not 50%? So. Let's first look at it using a single proportions test. So if we were doing that, we'd have our null hypothesis, which would be that the proportion who approve is equal to 0.5, and the alternative would be that the proportion who approve is not equal to 0.5. We'll then calculate our z-test statistic. We'll take our sample proportion, our p-hat, minus our null hypothesis proportion, right? And this is gonna be over our standard error, which is our 
p sub zero minus one p sub zero over our n, our standard error. And these values all come from above here, right? So this is our n, this is our p, sub p hat, and then this is our p sub zero. We plug those values in there, we get a z test statistic of 3.474. I hope that at this point, um, you can already kind of expect if you're gonna have a small or a large p-value based on that z test statistic. Uh, we said that a z test statistic greater than uh, two is should result in a small p-value, or will result, excuse me, not should, will result in a small p-value. And so we do our, our um, our fire up stat key we click normal distribution we don't need to change any of the parameters we're going to do right tail we're going to change this value um, to 3.474 and then we're going to take this value over here and multiply it by two because we have a two-tailed test okay now alternatively you could have done a two-tailed test instead of a right tail but in this situation, we just can do a two tail because it's going to be equivalent. If you do a two tail, then you would just be adding up this value and this value, which is just going to equal 0 0.0052. Great. Now, in this situation, we're, we have strong evidence against our null hypothesis, strong evidence in favor of our alternative. We would conclude that the per percent, percent of adults that support the inquiry impeachment query inquiry is not 50%, but in fact is greater than 50%. So how could we do this using a chi-square test statistic? Well, in that situation, we know that the null hypothesis would be that the proportion who approve is going to be equal to the proportion who disapprove, and that's going to be 0.5, right? Because if we're saying 50% of the adults approve, then the alternative, then that also means that 50% disapprove. So our null, our alternative hypothesis will be at least one of these p sub i's, either p a or p sub d, is not equal uh, to 0 0.05. Is not 0 0.05. <clears throat> We're going to plug in our observed values, and as a reminder, this comes from n times p sub i, so it comes from three three eight zero, and this is going to be multiplied by uh, 0 0.50, and then that is why these values are the same, 3380, 1690, 1690, we only have two values, and our alternative is that they're going to be, uh, I mean, our null is that they're equal to one another, and our observed counts, 1791 comes from up here, 1589 can just be calculated from 3380 3, minus 1791, and that's going to equal 1589. Calculate it, we get our chi-squared test statistic right here. Okay, so our k is gonna equal to two. We have two cells. We have a approved cell and a disapproved cell. Our degrees of freedom is gonna be two minus one or one. Come over here, open up the chi-squared test statistic. Um, I mean, chi-squared theoretical distribution on stat key. Uh, enter 12.072 here. And there's our p-value, 0 0.00051 with one degree freedom. Well, that value is nearly equivalent to this value. And it's in fact, it's, it is the same value. It's just that it's different because of some rounding. Now, <clears throat> so these two approaches are equivalent. And in fact, the chi-square statistic, as you can probably see here, or as you maybe could see here, is just the z statistic squared. So z squared is equal to our chi-square. Alternatively, if you take the square root of chi square, that's going to equal z. And um, and don't be confused by the fact that it says chi squared test. Um, don't don't worry about that squaring. You don't actually do any squaring other than in that actual formula uh, directly. Uh, you know where you've got the observed minus the expected squared over the expected. You'll do the squaring there, but nowhere else. 